So this prior to the month of what month are we in now? Tishri. Meaning? Meaning? New beginnings. The month of preparation was the month of Elul before. So this whole season is, isn't just something you just kind of land yourself into and okay, what, what we're doing this month. It is all deliberately prepared. You have to spend time, and the word for the month of Elul is introspection. I said before, it's about Father, it's about your brethren, but it's also about you. And Father wants you to introspect, look within you. David said, search my heart to see if there be any evil way within me. You always hear me say this is a mantra almost. There's no greater enemy than the one in me. My greatest enemy is the one in me. Nobody can mess me up worse than me. So it's about time of introspection, looking within oneself, searching within oneself, and the work needs to be done to undo all of the things that need to be undone, to smooth out the rough things within yourself. So we're going to talk a bit about that. But today is about Shabbat. Today, the first Shabbat keeper is who? He creates something, and then himself, to show you how important it is, I will enter into it. And I will observe it. If he does that, do we then have any right to say it doesn't matter? If he himself submits himself to his own creation mm -hmm. in time. He separates a portion of time and says, that is blessed, Baruch. That is kadosh. That is holy. And I will enter into it, which makes it holy. His presence sanctifies it. Mm -hmm. So if the source of all creation enters into Shabbat, what must all creation do? enter into Shabbat. And that is what we are called to do. And that is what we observe. In the Shabbat, it's not just about time. You're not wasting time. It is an appointment. How many of you know nowadays, if you book an appointment with your dentist and you miss that appointment three times, what happens? They take off. Same with the doctor. They ain't messing around with you no more. They will write you off. Yahuwah is king. He's made an appointment with all creation. He says, this is his mark, that you are his people. You're not wasting time. You're turning up for an appointment. Your seat is reserved. Your place has been booked. You being here is scoring you high credit with the most high. In that you being here, he says, that's all I need to see to mark you as my people. But when the end of judgment comes, which is what Yom Kippur is all about, judgment. When judgment day comes, all of this will be taken into account. Did you keep my Shabbat? And did you know what they meant? This is what our job is, to study and to teach the meaning of the Shabbat. What they mean to him, what they mean to you, what they mean to all creation. Okay. Something that was in my heart, I'm going to share with you my day-to-day -day journey. Every man is meant to, the, meant to be the priest, the Kohenim of his own home. Every man has the responsibility of becoming the role model in his house. Mm -hmm. How you pray is how the house will pray. That's right. How you Baruch bless is how the house will bless. They will literally mimic your words. So we have to be the role model. So there's some things you will see done in here. It might be strange to you, but I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to edify you as to how to be the priest of the home. So that your wife can model you. So that your children and your youngest and your sons can model you. So when they grow up and have their families, they know how to be the priest of the home. Because pops modeled it. Train up a child. In a way that he does not depart. And when he is older, he will not depart. Right. Hallelujah. So, the talit. And these things over time on your Hebraic journey... I want all the men to have their shofar. And women, get a shofar too. I know. I know. That's why. It's no joke. But if it's your desire and it's in here, Father will make it manifest there. Just have the desire and ask him. 
And I'm sure, ladies, you've asked for things before. Did you not get it? You got it, didn't you? You have not because you, you asked not. So ask him and your father will provide. But have you asked? So ask him. So the shofar will be in the home. If not shofars, over time, they'll accrue. And you'll have one for everybody in the, in the house. If you think, well, there was one time they couldn't even afford one. But then the talit. Now this was part of every Hebrew's garment, daily garment. It's become this over time, but it was not that originally. Before it was just an overcoat with the zitzit on there. But it's become a prayer shawl over time. And don't get the one with the black, please. Get the one with the blue. Because the black symbolizes them mourning the tabernacle, the destruction of the temple, sorry. This is reminding you of the mitzvah, the commandments, which is what Yahuwah sanctioned. So when you get your talit, and women can have prayer shawls as well, you will say your blessing. Blessed are you, Yahuwah, our God, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to enwrap ourselves in city. And as the family sees the head of the house, the priest of the house, notice the white meaning purity, the priest is wearing the prayer shawl and the family come under the hoopah of his prayer shawl. So you are literally uh, typifying, demonstrating, being a hooper, the covering of the family. So take a picture of that, so you have the prayer, and when you have your prayer shawl, you know how to pray. But the head of the house is the covering of the house. And when you lift up the prayer shawl, get the, this is called the, the gadol, the large prayer shawl. Get the large one, not the half one. So when you lift it up, everybody comes under the prayer shawl. It's beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. Let's all stand up as we say our Shema. Anybody know which way Jerusalem is now? I'm so confused. We keep moving different rooms. I'm lost. Which way is east? Hallelujah. Let's fall follow the way. Hallelujah. Everybody know the Shema nice and loud. If you don't know it, you can look at the screen. It's okay. Shema Israel, Yahuwah Elohim. Throughout the readings as well today, you can sound the shofar. You'll hear the points where you're meant to sound the shofar. All together, and notice the slight modification at the very bottom. I'll explain what it is in a second. All together. Be'ehavta et Yahuwa Elochecha Bechol Levatcha Uvchol Nafshecha Uvchol Miyodecha Be'ehavta Lelechecha Himocha Haya Yahuwa Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahuwah. Hallelujah. <coughs> By saying that last bit at the end, it's basically saying, I'm commanding you to do this because this is who I am and you belong to me. So this is a commandment. And on this hinges everything about who we are. Um, Brother Bram, would you give me some water, please? Two bottles, please. I should have brought some water with me. I think there's a pack in the kitchen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Oh, maybe seated, but we'll say the rest sitting down. <laughs> And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in the house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and you shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house, and on your gates. 
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. You may be seated. It's good to see the respect that we have for the Most High in the house. In this day and age, it is so important for us to be lights in this time of darkness. And this is a reminder for everyone to kindle the light. So we have visitors. Hey, bro. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. Let's make some room. Let's make some. Let's get some chairs. How was the drive down? Oh, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> you rocked it in, but maybe. It's <laughs> awesome. Okay. All together. Baruch Atah Yahuwah Yatsa Malek HaOlam Asher Kedeshen Bermitzvah Tov Vitzvah Lehiyot Olagoyim Benatan Lanu Yeshua Meshachemu or Ha'olam. Blessed are you, Yahuwah, our Creator, King of the Universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to be a light to the nations, and who gave to us Yeshua, our Messiah, the light of the world. Ladies only, go ahead. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with and the Word was human. He was with God in the beginning. All things came to be. It is so important. The Bible says that the men go out and bear the heat of the day, but the woman is the center of the home. Think of the, uh, the menorah. This center stick is representative of the woman. And it's representative of Yeshua, ultimately. But the woman being the center of the home, everything branches out from her. Everything. So how important is it to protect the center? How important is it to attend to the center, which feeds the other branches? So when you tend to the woman, you're tending to yourself. You're tending to the, the center, the source of the family. So that's why I ask the women to read that, because it's so important for the woman to be attended to but for the woman to attend to herself. You have to spend that time, ladies, or else you'll have nothing to give. You've got to take that time away. You've got to have that time for you. You've got to have that time with Yeshua, or else you will empty yourself and bleed yourself out dry. There'll be nothing. You have to go to the well. Remember the woman by the well? She was going to the well. Every great woman in scripture was going to the well for herself. Zipporah, Rivka, yeah? Leah and Rachel, they were shepherdesses. They knew how to go to the well. So you need to know how to go to the well, the source for yourself, and replenish yourself, or else there'll be nothing left of you. It's very interesting to pick up the woman going to the well, because it's always used to be women that go to the well, never men. Because in the Eastern culture, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I mean, I read this fantastic book. Oh, that's that awesome. tells you yeah. the idioms in the Aramaic, in the Hebrew as well. It talks about the Eastern culture, white women, and I was and what Gary says is picked up here. I was reading it's fantastic. Yeah, <coughs> it's always women going to the well because it's an Eastern culture thing. So yeah, have a read of these. Get this. It's fantastic. So, Shabbat Shuvah, meaning Shabbat of return. Shuv means return, but Teshuvah, which is what the word Shuv is, is a root rooted out of, Teshuvah means repentance. So it's both a return to Father, but along your journey of returning, maybe you need to repent as well. Okay? And feel free, guys, to jump in and share. We've got Matt over there. I know that Matt's is a good scholar as well, so we're going to have a good time today. As our custom is, let's all stand as we say the bracha for the reading of the word.
ברכו את יחווה המבורך, ברוך את יחווה המבורך לעולם ועד. Say with me all together. ברוך אתה יחווה אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר בחר בנו מכל העמים, ונתן לנו את תורתו. ברוך אתה יחווה נותן התורה. Hallelujah. Bless Yahuwah the Blessed One. Blessed are you, Yahuwah, our Elohim, King of the Universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and has given us His Torah. Blessed are you, Yahuwah, giver of the Torah. Sound the show. Shabbat Shuva, so relevant, so important. Skip, 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 skip. So, let's just back up before we come into Yom Kippur. So we talked a bit about Elul. So from Rosh Hadesh of the previous month, it's all about introspection, searching oneself. The word Elul literally means harvest. You've heard me talk a lot about the harvest. So you are preparing the harvest. From the month of Elul, your mindset was all harvest, hence why the messages went out about we are preparing for the harvest. Um, from the ancient Arcadian, to search, meaning to search oneself out. Introspection, Heshbon Hanefesh, searching the soul. So from this time of Elul coming into Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Teruah, it's about declaring, proclaiming, proclaiming. Hence why we went out and we proclaimed the call to come into the body. 
the call to the nations to come to know Yahuwah. So from the crescent moon, which is that symbol that many are familiar with with Islam, Islam simply took everything from the Bible. That's right. The renewed moon, the crescent moon, it's just taken everything. Yes, they've also taken many things from paganism, Baal worship, mm -hmm. but the months, the new moon, the renewed month starts at the crescent moon. So we look for that sliver. And when we see the sliver, that night, you must go out and sound the shofar. So many of you went out, as soon as you saw the sliver, it was confirmed that the month of Tishri has begun, you sound the, the shofar. Meaning, deliverance is coming, it's the voice of Yeshua. Deliverance of the righteous is coming, but judgment also for the wicked. So it's good news for one group of people, bad news for another group of people. Joel chapter 2 and 3 are key texts which talk about the day of the Lord, the day of Yahuwah. When he comes, it will be terrible. That's what, this is where we were looking for, that appearing of the renewed moon. And that's why it takes a few days to confirm, is it going to be today? Can we see it? Is it cloudy? Can we see the new moon, renewed moon? So that's why it says in the Bible, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. It wasn't in reference to not knowing when Yeshua comes back. That's right. It was in reference to when can we see the renewed moon that's right. to declare the month of Tishri. But you see, without understanding the Bible from a Hebraic perspective, we go off with the wrong message. Take a picture of this, please. These are some key texts to do with con uh, in connection with this time of the month of Yom Teruah, also known as Rosh Hashanah. But I want to talk about Rosh Hashanah because we've also apparently misunderstood that. Move on. Okay. Second Peter three twelve. As you wait for the day of Yahuwah and work to hasten his coming, that day will bring on the destruction of the heavens by fire. Remember the world was destroyed by water before, but Adam prophesied it would be by fire. Adam's prophecy is actually not found in the Bible, I believe. I think it's in an, it's in an additional book. But the prophecy of Adam is that the world will be destroyed by fire, which is confirmed uh, by Peter. We believe that Peter actually got this from the book of Enoch himself. That day will bring on the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt from the heat. But we, following along with his promise, wait for new heavens and new earth, in which righteousness will be at home. Therefore, dear friends, as you look for these things to do do everything you can to be found by him without spot or defect and at shalom, at peace. So this is a watching and a waiting and a looking. And as we look for the renewed moon, it's also we are looking for renewed heavens and renewed earth. That's what we're looking for. So everything has a reason, a purpose. These are all shadows and types that have fulfillment later on. So Yom Teruah, meaning the day of blowing, the day of shouting, the day of declaring, we are not to be silent about this. Rosh Hashanah is the name given to it, but we also call it Yom Teruah, day of trumpets. Now Rosh Hashanah simply means the head of the year. Now this is where there is now, we even within rabbinical sources are re-examining as to have we got the right day for Rosh Hashanah? Because it's supposed to be now. This is Yantaru is Rosh Hashanah. But there's also another head of year. In fact, there's two or three others in the Bible. Did you know there's a head of year for trees? A new year for planting trees. Now, they're actually saying, this is within rabbinical sources and theological circles, when Yeshua was being crucified, me out, me go to you all. What things happened to Yeshua during his crucifixion? Just prior to his crucifixion, before he went on the cross, what did they do to him? What do you mean? Before he went on the cross? Before. Beat him. So literally before, in the running up to it, what happened to Yeshua? And it's all in connection with Rosh Hashanah. How far we going back? Just like what just literally, that? just when he's getting beaten. Okay. That that part we going. Keep going, yeah. So he's getting beaten, getting whipped. 
Um, no, but it's been open, shared. Open question. Yep, crown or thorns. Bam! Crown. Mm. Who gets crowned? Okay. King. It was prophetic. But it was Pesach, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. You see where I'm going with this? He had to be crowned king of kings on the earth. But kings, according to the rabbis, are crowned when? Rosh Hashanah, which is Yom Tru, which is now. But he was crowned in Pesach. Rabbis have just found in 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1, there is actually an illusion that kings are to be crowned in Pesach, not in this month of Tishri. And Yeshua was crowned at Pesach, Praise fulfilling the type. This is what is amazing. So everything about Yeshua's crucifixion is literally planned out. He had to be king of kings and lord of lords, right. but he hadn't been crowned yet by men of earth. Yep. And who was the ruling power of the earth at the time? Rome. And he was crowned by them as king of kings and lord of lords. It's not surprising though. It all makes sense. It's not surprising because we know that he, took, he became the high priest. Mm -hmm. Because the high priest had ripped his clothes. Right, and handed it over to him. Yeah, yeah. So, and we know that he is, he is the, the high priest. We know that he's the, the king of kings. Um, that just kind of symbolizes and yeah. shows you what um, in physical form basically him getting that mm -hmm. again. So it should be shown. Yeah. If you just uh, read it. And it's right there that, as he said, the priest had handed it over to him, the high priest. But then Rome had to hand over, and they did both in the crown on his on his forehead, on his head, but also the title, Yahud, uh, Yeshua ben Nazareth, Melech Hamelechim, Yeshua of Nazareth, King of Kings. And what did they say? No, don't don't write that. Don't don't put that up. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. I ain't changing it. This is amazing. Every shadow and every type was fulfilled to the T. So the king of kings must be coronated at Pesach, which the Bible says is the head of the year, not Yom Teruah. Anyway, you got somebody who raised their hands? Go ahead. Um, touching the crowning of Messiah on mm. earth. Even though the Romans did it as a mockery at the time, they were yeah. mocking him and beating him at the same time and spatting him and insulting him. They didn't know they were fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. You see, so the enemy, he will fulfill prophecy without even knowing it. Yes, absolutely. And what else did they put on him as well? Remember, it's supposed to be a king. Rogue. What color? Red. Right, scarlet. Red. Yeah. So he was dressed, yeah. adorned. And he was crowned as king. But they even remember what they did. What did they do? The Roman soldiers did something else. The Jew. Before that. That's correct. We got that one. They bowed down. Yes. They were mocking him, but they bowed down. Every shadow was fulfilled. Everything. Man, I'm, I just, I, I love this. Stuff. I love it. 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 So, this head of the year for the priests is what they symbolize is the renewing of the, of the uh, every king later on was coronated at this time of year but the priests recognized there was a rolling away of sin a putting away of sin which again happened at Passover really really but this is the year what they they do um, recognize that the kings are coronated and also sin is rolled away for another year so this is what we see not so much about the kings, but about the end time work of Messiah. That Yom Kippur represents the eradication of death, hell, and sin. So this is why it concludes the end of the year. It concludes everything. So this is why it's so important that all of our sin will be forgotten and disposed of and remembered no more. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's lift up the shofar, man. So just go ahead. Before you go so far, mm -hmm. uh, Rosh Hashanah, not the beginning. No. The no. That's why we put more focus on this. As opposed to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, yeah, yeah. Day of Trumpets. Yeah. Okay? Um, 
Yeah, I'll leave that. Yeah, that was just to be clear. Just to be clear. Those just to be clear. Home. Just to be clear. So it's, it's important to understand what the rabbinical orders are doing, but it's important to understand what we should have been doing and how we should perceive it. 200 AD, it became known. So this is when it kicked off. Known as the head of the year by the priesthood. After the destruction of the temple. That's when it started. It is believed to commemorate the birthday also of Adam and Eve. And also creation, the earth. So this is what they memorialize it as. Nobody can prove it 100%. I can neither confirm nor deny. But this is, this is what it commemorates. What is was that to, com to prove the, how old the earth is, you say that? <sighs> they say it's 7,000 years old. We're in the seventh day now. Seven, we're in the 7,000 years. That's right, yeah. But they say that this month, Yom Teruah, the day of Yom Teruah, commemorates creation, the birth of Adam and Eve, the yeah. birth of Eve creation. So does carbon data prove that? <laughs> carbon dating? <laughs> Carbon dating is only good for certain things, not yeah. carbon dating for everything. Right. And there's different types of carbon dating, which we'll talk about maybe in the DNA of Shabbat. There's like 20 different carbon dating yeah. techniques. It is a time of great singing and dancing and joy. So as much as, like I said, it depends where you stand with Yeshua, how you see this day. Some of you are like, yeah, bring it on. Come on, Yeshua. Even now, come Yeshua now. And some people will not be ready for it. When Yeshua returns, some will be exalting and jumping and leaping and saying hallelujah, and some will be running into the caves and hiding, the Bible says. But this is the time of, in fact, it's common for weddings to take place now, because it's the month of new beginnings. And how many of you know that when you, you might have been courting someone or dating someone, but when you get married, it's a new journey. It's the first day of a new journey together. And isn't it prophetic? that there's a wedding taking place in, well, not quite in a harbor, but somebody in a harbor is getting married. Guess who? Anyone ever guess who's getting married in a harbor? Who's getting married? Who's getting married? Who's getting married? <laughs> <Who's looking at laughs> me? This is going to be a surprise. Hi. Our brother Alex is getting married. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. So Alex is getting married actually in the week of Sukkot. Praise so let's all keep Alex in prayer. And he says he'll be bringing his bride to a harbor, and they'll be settling here, and this will be their home. So we just need to pray for them and just be congratulating them as well when we see them on the 21st of this month. So 21st is when they're getting married. It'll be a small ceremony, but they'll do something bigger later on. So at the moment, he's here, um, and his bride's actually in this country. She, I think she works in Ireland. But you all get to meet. It's Alex and Alexandra. <laughs> so it's not hard to remember their names. I said, what are you going to call your kids? <laughs> so yes, it's common for weddings to take place during this time. Alex's full name is... Um, uh, Alexander. Yeah, Alexander, yes. <laughs> so let's lift up a show of our blast with them. Come on. Yeah, Come on. It's a call to declare war and against the enemies of Yahuwah. So the different shofar blasts, which we'll actually practice them as a congregation, there's about four different shofar blasts um, that you blow. And even each tribe had a particular shofar yeah. call, which designated Reuben, Neftali, Benjamin to move, and only that tribe. Mm. So they knew the tribe, the tribes knew their calls. So yep, you should all have the shofar and know your shofar blasts. So it would be good to practice that. Shabbat Shuva is also a very important time for forgiveness, as I've said before. And I like the word forgive. It's something that you go forth and give. It's a gift. Forgiveness is a gift that you should not withhold. You should go forth and give forgiveness. In fact, when we give the gift of forgiveness, then we are more like our Father, who is merciful and kind, is he not? Mm. His mercy enjoys forever. That's right. Father is merciful. The mark and the sign of a true king is that he's merciful. And Father expects the 
the constituents of his government to reflect his character, to be merciful, and to be forgiven in kind. So in this period of what's called Yamim Noraim, which means the days of repentance, which is from Yom Teruah, we have 10 days called the days of all, where you literally search out yourself to see, is there any wrong? Am I holding offense with anyone? Am I offended by it or am I offending someone? And we search out our souls to put things right. Has anyone got anything to share about that before we move on? Any testimonies you want to share at this point? Anything you've been studying along this? No? Okay. Well, a good passage to read, which we won't read now, but please make a note of that portion of text. Deuteronomy 29, verses 9 through to 31, 30. And that, let that be your evening reading tonight when you go home. Let's take a snap of that. And this Torah portion is often read during this time. It is the heavenly gift. Forgiveness is a heavenly gift. Forgiveness is a lot about you. That you seek to forgive people and you forgive quickly. The first step of forgiveness. The second step to forget it. When you forgive, you don't hold it. You don't hold a memory. We don't become, we don't go from being hysterical to being historical. Yeah? We don't keep record of wrongs. In fact, what does love, Corinthians 13 say? Love holds no record of wrongs. We don't keep a filing cabinet, an X-file of all the issues and all the wrongs. Let it go. You know, sometimes it's horrible when someone keeps bringing up an offense that they said that we kind of squashed that. And they, it means that they haven't really healed, they haven't really forgiven. If you keep bringing it up, you haven't really forgiven me for it. And that's not really love on your part to do that. If we really love one another, we will forgive and let it go. Don't keep bringing it back up because it just opens up old wounds. We will never heal from this. So once we've gone through forgiveness, Am I hearing the radio? Okay. The TV outside. Oh, the TV outside, okay. Once we forget it, then we move on. Until we do the first two, how can we get to step three? We can't really move on from this. But once we can move on, once we get traction and we start moving forward, then we can now prosper and succeed in our relationships. That's so, it. go ahead. That second one there, does it tell us in scripture to forget? Let me tell you, put, put it a better way. If Father says, I forget it. It doesn't mean that he can't remember it. Yeah. It means he doesn't bring it back up against you. Yeah. The record, the criminal record, is a sponge. That's what he says. So by his character, if Father does it, then we should be modeling him. Mm. And Yeshua says, follow me. Follow me. So we are supposed to imitate the Father. Imitate Yeshua. If Father says, when I looked at your criminal record against me, your list was long. And when, I, when you came into me, I expunged the record. I wiped it clean. It says, I cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. He took it and went, and I'm not going to go look for it. <laughs> That's what Father says in his word that he does concerning my offenses. He does not recall them. The word is there is... He does not remember them, but it's actually he does not recall them to mind. He's not holding it over you, ready to just drop it on you every time you mess up. So if Father does that, how much more should we? You remember the parable of the, the creditor? Okay. He owed money, and he was forgiven. But then when somebody that owed him money, when that situation came up, he did not forgive the person that owed him that money. So in the end, it was worse for him because he was shown mercy, so he should have learned to be merciful in case someone owed him money. And yes, someone did owe him, owe him money, and he was heavy on that man, unforgiving, merciless on that man. So the judgment was worse for him. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you? you yeah? See, I, I understand the forgive part. I, I, I get that. It's the forget, forget. The forget for me, mm -hmm. um, I think forget is something that I, I, I don't believe you're supposed to forget. 
And the reason why I say this is because sure. you have to learn from experiences and mistakes. And Absolutely, so I agree. When these things happen, you learn from it and you adapt. And you have to, you have to forgive, obviously. But the forgetting part is, 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 is important for you to learn and grow. Yeah. You know? so, Otherwise, you'll, you, I don't think you can mature or, or, or learn the hard lessons um, by just forgetting everything. You know what I'm saying? If, I was, if, if something was done to me, and I said, oh, you know, I'm just going to forget about that. And then I put myself in that situation again. It's done to me again. Yeah. And I keep on with these. I put myself in a very difficult, awkward situation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So from that, for me, it's more like learn and, 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 and kind of adapt yeah. and, and go about it differently. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So I wouldn't walk into a lion's den next time. I'll be like, you know, I know that's a lion's den. So yeah. I'm just going to hear go around the outside of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I see what you mean. I do. I think there's a standard that you have set. And when he says he's forgiven us and he's forgotten our sins, you've already said it. He, he, he showed us a way how to do it. And we're not going to do it in ourselves. We're going to do it in him. But our confidence is always going to be in uh, It's not in flesh. Flesh fails. But when we walk in the spirit and live in the spirit and live by faith and not by sight, we're going to be able to even forget it and know that we can trust you to protect and obviously we're human and at the back of our mind, let's be real, at the back of our mind, we've been through a situation and a circumstance and it, it doesn't hurt us, but let's be real also that Yah is our defender, he is our fortress, he's a mighty and a strong tower, so anything that he entrusts us with and tells us to do, he's already done. And he's going to carry us through. So when he says forgive and forget, I'm going to forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to lean and trust in you yeah. so that I can move on and progress to succeed. Mm -hmm. You see, so if we're at the back of our minds, and that's, we've got to get rid of that as well. Mm -hmm. Because we, because Yah, Yah has, the, has done that. He's written off our sin yeah, yeah. because he loves us. <coughs> and he wants us to move on and yeah, succeed with him, right. in yeah. him. Right. Not by ourselves. Right. If we live in ourselves and, and claim that way for you, and we can't forgive and we can't forget how we're going to move and how we're going to succeed, yeah. we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. But we, we want to succeed in you. I have a problem with that because the way I look at it, if, if, I, don't, if I forget, then I'm not coming with that linear thinking mm. where it's not looking back on the things that have taken place in the past and learning from that, mm. which Scripture shows us that we're not, we don't do things in a non, in a linear way. We do it in a non-linear way. Do you understand what I'm saying? So rather than being a straight line, where they'll say, "Oh, we look forward to the future," it's not about just looking forward. We've got to look back in the past in order to learn from the mistakes, so that we we continue to perfect things. This is why I don't believe in forgetting. You have to learn. So you would look back and say, "This happened before. Like our ancestors did this. We're not going to make that same mistake." So we take a lesson from that. And we do the non-linear, and we do this more or less like a spiral. With the same line, things happening in the same line, in the same, um, in the same pattern, but we look at it and say, at this time, this is what took place before. What, what happened around that? This happened destruction, okay, and this was because of the actions of... So, as his people, as his children, will say, our ancestors did this, let's not make these mistakes again. Let's learn from that and change this to, to, be, to, to move more down a narrow path, you know what I'm saying, towards your, towards the house. You know, and that's, that's what I'm looking at, that's what I'm I want to say something, but I really want to hold my pee to the end. Matt, you got to come in, because I can feel you from here. <laughs> I can feel you. It's not funny for me, I, I can feel you. <laughs> but I, I would just say, <coughs> to forgive and to forget, to kind of relate to you. The forgiveness is the guilt of the person who's done the wrong. So the forgetting is someone's guilt, it's not holding it against them perpetually. So every, what everyone else has said is very true as well, you know, you don't, if you have a friend and he steals from you, and then you invite him to your house again and he steals from you again, would you carry on inviting him and letting him to keep stealing from you? Know, you've, you've got to learn from your past, but forgetting is the person's guilt, because to hold on to it is to hold, is to hold it over them, and none of us have that right, I suppose. See, the thing is about forgetting, this, this, we need to kind of stay here a bit. 
it's the cleansing of your heart and allowing a fresh start to be to present itself if that makes sense because what i'm concerned about is is if we don't wipe the slate clean we'll start putting contingency plans into place so i'm already preempting that if you come around to my house i'm going to move the goldfish out the way i'm going to move you know because i know what you're like i'm preempting you I'm already forming contingency plans. I'm not really trusting you. I've not wiped the slate clean. I'm just now, I've gone into pre preservation mode. I'm thinking, I've got to move these things out of the way. But what if my man has corrected? What if my man no longer is like that anymore? I'm not giving him the chance to enter into a clean mindset with between he and I. I've already got contingency plans in place. Are we then really walking in love in that example? No, we're not. The reason why Father says he wants you how many times should I forgive my brother? 70 times 70. In other words, it's infinitely. That's right. So, Father wants us to be clean slates with each other, to keep trusting. And yes, you did it to me once, you did it to me twice. But if I show, maybe I'm sounding a bit naive for some here, but if I just show you, I'm not going to hide the stuff away from you. I want to trust you. You're giving the person an opportunity to function right. But if we, if I do that for the contingency plans, maybe you might do that with me with something else. You know, got to put the, put the Carmel porridge away when Gary comes around. <laughs> right? Right. If you start forming contingency plans, then we're both becoming as bad as each other in different yeah. ways. When do we actually wipe the slate clean and just begin a new? <clears throat> Hence, we're talking about new heavens, new earth. So you, you just touched on forgiveness. Uh, again, you did touch on more on forgive, forgiveness, yeah? And you said if you <coughs> if you keep trying to put contingencies um, plans in place, mm. then there's something else that you're not doing. Yeah. And that's being upfront with that person and say, hey, I know you came here the last time and one and hey, you took something. Do you know what I'm saying? That you have to be upfront with that person and say, look, that's I want to be able to trust you. Yes. I want to be able to invite you to my home again. And I want to sit down and break bread. Yeah. But I can't do that if, do you know what I'm saying, until you correct this thing, brother. And that's, that's, that's different now. But now? That's, that's, that's where I'm saying, that's why I'm, I'm still stuck in that moment with forgetting, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do, you don't hold it and hold it yeah. over it, but you have to, there's something that has to change in order to correct the situation so that it can be harmonious. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sorry. Because I'm, I'm going to come to you. Until we deal with this, this is linked with trust. If we don't have trust, then we've got, we're stuck here. Well, he forgives you, but we're talking about the issue between man and man here now. Because Father says, I will forgive and I will forget. But we're talking about that human aspect now, which is supposed so to mimic you. Yeah. It's the same principle, oh. but we're kind of talking it through here right now. We're trying, oh. to, we're trying to bring Father's goodness down into our hearts and become like Father. And we're just talking it through. Go ahead. All right. Let's, let's bring this down to then you have a dispute, right? Or something happens between you and you. <coughs> Say, I'm the adversary against you. Right? This is how I'm looking at it. If you want to be able to be in the position of forgiving and forgetting, the best way to do it is you confront me straight and tell me directly to my face how I heard you. Yes. Right? Yes. Loud and clear to me. Yes. yes. If I do it a second time and a third time, right? You need to get through to me again. Some way or another, I'm going to get hit by my conscience. That is how you're going to be able to forget. Come in. Now you can start to trust me. Can you see a change in me? You see, that's how, that's how the forgiveness works. Because we've got to be real. Mm. Human beings yep. fail each other. That's right. And sometimes trust is gone out of the window. That's right. But, we, but trust can be won back. That's why I mentioned about, yeah, you know, we're doing this in here. Yeah. If you do it in yourself, you're going to put, up, put those things in place to, to prevent me from hurting you again. Mm -hmm. But you know what? If you put your trust in the Father, you've got the equipment to deal with it properly. Mm -hmm. So it's the reason why Yeshua said to the, to the guy who had riches that it's harder for him to make it to heaven because of his riches. Because if you've got nothing, 
material. There's nothing for anybody to take in that sense. In this, in this yeah, situation, yeah. do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're not worried about those things. The only thing you'd probably be concerned about is how that person treats you or treats others while you're with you. So can you not forgive and move on? Can you not get no. to move on without No. Because what, what we have to look at, right, is what Yah did. Yah gave us a sign. Yah actually went through it. He sent his son from glory. Mm -hmm. to, to, do, do we really get what Yeshua did for us? <laughs> do we really get it? Because this is how I get it. I get this. He came from glory to a rotten place that rejected him. Even his own people that he called Israel rejected him, or the majority of them. Right? He forgave all of that. He even died for everyone who rejected him upon the stake or upon the tree. Right? And that, that shows me how much he forgot, for, for, forgot. <coughs> he forgave and forgot and moved on and succeeded. Yeah? So that is what he wants us to practice. And he doesn't want us to do anything in our, of, of and in ourselves. See, I've forgiven many situations and I've moved on from it, but I still remember them. And that's, 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 not, that's, not, that's, 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 that's your okay. Brain, let's, not, let's not confuse that with your brain's capacity to retain information. Exactly. You're meant to do that. That's what and I'm trying to say. Of, you're meant to learn from it. Yeah. But in the sense, that's why I keep saying using the word, recalling it and then letting that issue yeah. cause you to hold ought in your heart mm. or ought in your mind concerning that person. You don't trust them that level that you should do because you remember what they did. So you're not letting it let become. It's not, you're not letting it hold you bound, stuck. We need to be able to. Okay, this person hurt me. Maybe they hurt me because they were deliberately trying to hurt me. Maybe they hurt me because they've been hurt themselves. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they've just been raised a certain way that they take more than they give. We don't know. Everybody's raised differently. Yeah. But either way, there was an offense. Mm -hmm. If they knew better, maybe if they were born again, they wouldn't have done that to me. Mm -hmm. But maybe they've grown now. But if you're still holding on to stuff because you won't forget it and let it go, you won't wipe the slate clean. You remember what they did. You've learned from it. <clears throat> but now Father wants you to become pure white. Hence why Yom Kippur is all about white. <laughs> Pure, clean, pure heart, clean slate. I ain't got no white on today, <laughs> but it's Yom Kippur, just for everyone, we can all wear white. It's all about a clean slate, pure heart. Okay. Well done. <laughs> so, are we clear? It's not about um, whether you hold on. You, of course you're meant to remember it. You're going to remember what they did. But you don't, let, you don't use it then to form a contingency plan. You don't use it then to say, I'm not going to open my heart up to you anymore. Because sometimes the only way people actually learn not to offend is by you being open-hearted with them and showing love, not withholding love. This is especially true in relation. We're going to go into this a lot when we talk about focus on family. You lead by example. Don't show them. Don't want to lack in an area, so you demonstrate that. In a way, it's like you treat people how you want to Exactly. It's not about you coming down, it's about you coming up a level and then coming up to where you are. Just because they may be stunted in their ability to be mindful and love you, doesn't mean that you shut the doors. <laughs> yeah, you, you, have to, you have to be mindful of what's, what's packaged in there as well because there's many different situations that will come out of that. And you have to be prepared to walk the same path that you should walk in regards to persecution because he put himself, as you know, he put himself in so much, there was so much thrown at him. And basically, if you're going to walk that path, you have to prepare yourself to stick to it. You know what I'm saying? Don't go quarter the way and say, you know what? I'm not going to be bitten again or I'm not going to. You have to be prepared to go so, the whole house. So, can I paraphrase what you're saying in this way? And correct me if it's not what you're saying. Just because you got hurt, it's not an excuse for you to stop loving. You've got to be prepared to still put your heart out there. Yeshua put his heart out there knowing they're going to crucify him, knowing they're going to reject him, knowing they're going to spit in his face. 
every day. Call him crazy. Pull out the man's beard. That was the hurt. They, he knew that that's what me being loving to you would <laughs> incur, but I'm not going to stop. You've got to be committed and deliberate in your love walk. It does not always mean you're going to be received, but your source is Yeshua. When your source is Yeshua, you have no choice but to love. It is the most powerful force of change is love. The most powerful force of change is love. And it's the, it's the longer lasting force as well. The force of love, the power of love, it sends shockwaves through generations. Is that making sense what I'm saying to you? It will change not just you, but generations later will recall the love that was shown. I'm often told when I'm around um, my older generation of people that I met when I was a kid and they're still around now. And they still always tell me, your mother is such a good woman because I remember when she was so good to me. She's a good woman. And these are acts that she did back in the 40s and 50s and they still recall it now because when you show love to people, people will not forget. People will not forget. You show kindness to someone, and it will set up a credit record with you that will last for decades. In fact, it will be passed on to generations, go, and, go to so-and-so's house. In fact, we see this in the Bible, that when the patriarchs would look for wives for their children, they're sending their sons back to Syria to get a bride from there. Why? Because our people are good stock people. We know the way they're bred. We know the kind of kindness that we're accustomed to showing to one another. Get a wife from there. So, I'm going off on, off on a tangent here, but we need to deal with this area of knowing that forgiveness, treat forgiveness, not as something you deserve. You don't wait till the person deserves to forgive. I said you go forth in forgiveness. So you give forgiveness as a gift, not dependent on whether they deserve it or not. Did you deserve to be forgiven by Yeshua? Then good. None of us deserved it. Because we were lost in our sin, having a wonderful time in it too. And Father, <laughs> Father came and grabbed you by the, the cuff of your neck somehow. He interrupted your life, he interrupted your day, he cross-sectioned you, ripped off your car so you could say, you know what, I need to stop and take account of my life and I need help. Father forgave you before you even knew about him. So think about, as you said, do we really know what Yeshua did for us? Because the Bible tells me that all of your sin was forgiven before you even knew him. Can I, uh, and it's, it's the month that I've well. Yep. So when Yeshua landed here, and um, landed. <laughs> 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 and the bass drop. And he, he would laugh, should I say, when he was making movements then? And he said to the lady, I haven't come for you for the last few months. At that point, did he forget or forgive? Because there was a change though, that, that was a key moment for, for, for the nation. And later on, obviously, from that moment, he knew what he came to do. And he obviously prepared himself on the cross and the last words that he says was he asked for forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. So That's, that is the key example there. There was a stage though. You said the forget and the forgive. Correct me if I'm wrong, we're just talking here. I don't believe the forget part came straight away. The forgiveness is already given yeah. by Father. Mm -hmm. But the forget bit depends on if you confess. If you confess to your sin and you repent of your sin, at that point, the record is closed. The forget part doesn't happen until you make an action. You have to do something on your part. When you acknowledge him as king, when you submit to his Torah, 
and become a child of the Most High, then it's forgotten. The letter, the letter. And correct me, if, correct me if you have a different opinion. We're talking here. Scripture says something. I can't remember where it is, but I know I remember reading something about sharing your confess your faults one to another. You may be healed. The effectiveness of every righteous man available. Hallelujah. That's the one. <laughs> um, I'm just. That's what. That's what just comes to mind in regards to what you were just saying. Mm. So that's that's what I wanted to point out. This is the good one we need to bring up. Thank you for bringing it up, Dwayne. You know why I love the word so much? It's all about object lessons and putting things into practice. It's not about this. Father expects us to confess our faults one to another. Mm -hmm. Now, in a humanistic mind, I'm going to look to see if, do I, can I really trust you, though? Yeah. Can I, do you right. mean you really roll together like that, though? Now, yeah. I, I think I'll go to Dwayne instead, yeah. and I'll share that. But Father doesn't want us to see one another as different in the body. There's no dissimilitude. We're all even. We're all equal. We're all the same. We are brother and sister. That's it. So we are to trust one another. How will you know trust and learn trust unless people trust you? Yeah? That's how we all work. How you trust well. And we'll, that grows. You grow in that. We all grow. None of us are the standard of trust and the standard of love. We all have to grow in that. We all have to learn to be trustworthy. And we've all made mistakes. And when you see that my brother trusts me with his heart and his life, it puts a weight upon you that you start to realize, you know what, I don't deserve this, but he's trusting me with his life. He's really loving me. And, I, I, you know? and the more time we spend together, the more we share. And we become a heart. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Yes. So, the forgiveness, we give this as a gift, a free gift. Unconditional is the word. Then we move on to, we move past, I've forgiven you for the offense, now I'm no longer going to hold it against you. Notice the stairs, we're climbing higher. Where are we going? We're to heaven. Yeah? So we're climbing the stairs, we're coming up higher. We're forgetting, we're learning, I'm not going to record it. In, in fact, even within myself, stop practicing recording stuff. To yourself. The more you rehearse it within your mind, the more it becomes indelibly impressed in your mind and you won't forget it. You call the offense to mind before you call the fact that I'm supposed to love you. We're supposed to walk in shalom. So stop recording stuff. It'd be nice if when we say we clean the slate, you actually didn't even remember it. And I'm at that age now where I don't remember stuff anyway. I'm just like, it's gone. Yeah. Which is sometimes good. It means I'm just generally just clean slated with you. Not by choice. <laughs> so then we move on. We finally move on. Not just we move on, you move on. Let me, let me change the word move on. You grow up. Immature people hold offense and hold it long and like to hold on to it. Immature. Maturity says, I'm going to let this stuff go. I've told you before about the word offense. The word offense comes from the Greek word for like a bear trap. It's meant to trap you, hold you in place, and then cut you deeply and wound you. That's what offense does. So you're trapped, you can't move on, it's cutting into you. The more you try to move, the more it's cutting through to the bone. You've seen bear traps? Once that thing fires and, and releases, you're not going anywhere. You're gonna die there. So that's what offense is meant to do. Hold you in place until you literally die. Of the offense. Who mm -hmm. was it? Who joined the raised your hand? Go ahead and do it. Let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. Simplify it even more. Mm -hmm. If we can't forgive mm -hmm. and if we can't forget, mm -hmm. there's a burden right there. Mm -hmm. There is a load right there. Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're in the trap, you know, it's not anyone else. Yeah. Because we say that we, we belong to Yah. Yeah. Right? And, and we can't release, we can't let go. Are foolish, really, they're foolish things because they, these things come to test us as well, to make us strong. So, when we can start forgiving people, no matter what it is, and then forgetting we've taken a load of ourselves mm -hmm. and, we, and we've been an example to that, that, that offender so that they can come to the yard as well. Yeah. It's a horrible thing where if I, a nasty, horrible, vile person, just bad in character, come into your life and offend you, hurt you, curse you out, rob from you, steal from you, then walk away. Who's the offended? Me or you? You. Though 
I'm the offender, I walk away happy and fine. I've just dumped on you and left you with all the nasty stuff. When it's really my character, you were fine before, but I've now messed you up, but I go away happy as Larry. You're now the one stuck in the bear trap, the offense. But you can get free if you follow this. It's not about, this is not about the offender. This is talking about you being free. We don't want to become stuck in offense. This is how you get out of it. This is about you wiping the state clean and not being stuck in the bear trap because the offender is happy for you to stay in the bear trap for the rest of your, not my problem. You don't want people to cause you to be stuck. How do you get unstuck? Forgive, forget, move on. Does it mean that they will learn the error of their ways? Not necessarily, but you're not waiting on them for you to be free. Your freedom is not dependent on them. He may, he may end up, or she may end up in jail, death row, whatever. Does that mean you stay stuck in the bear trap? Do not allow other people's issues to cause you to have an issue and be stuck in that issue. It wasn't even your issue in the first place. Is what I'm saying making sense? Yeah. If you don't agree, please, we're here talking and sharing. I'll give you an example. Dwayne, then, then Junior. So basically, I had a situation. I'm trying to show somebody out of the way. And um, very confrontational about certain things. Um, not willing to take on board. Uh, even when you use scripture to show them passages after passages, you know, it's like they're still denying what they're seeing. Uh, and in the end, this person turns around and says, Oh, I don't want to talk about scripture with you no more. You're, you're a good brother, you're, you're, you're like a brother to me. But when it comes to speaking about scripture, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fair enough. And it hurt, I know, like, it hurt. But I have to give that time to allow me and this person to kind of move past it. Do you know what I'm saying? So, like, rather than you know, having that communication still open at that point um, where things could have probably got worse. I closed the communication for a short while, allowed time to pass, and then reopen the communication again. Mm -hmm. And we're good. You know, I know that I respect your boundaries, that you don't want to talk about scripture. I won't initiate it, but if you initiate, I'm fine. <laughs> it's that, it's that, it's literally that. I am going to fight because that's what I'm meant to do. But if you ask me, I will respect your wishes, and I won't discuss scripture with you. But the moment that you touch on it, you know that you just want to go on and I will proceed. So I'm just saying that's that's where I'm at with that kind of you know forgiving and forgetting and whatever else. It's forgotten. It's forgotten in that sense. And um, all I can do at this point is respect what's been asked and just keep going. Oh, no. <laughs> and I want to say something before Junior comes in. You know sometimes we can have issues with we can have issues with person A, but then we take that issue or that situation and we let it cookie cutter. B, C, person D, person E. We carry issues over to other relationships because of what hurts us over here. And if we don't learn to apply the antiseptic of forgiveness and forgetfulness to ourselves, we will end up having sores that fester for relationship after relationship, after relationship. Go on, Chief. Yeah, it's just such a point what you mentioned about maturity. Or the, uh, do you think? I just want to add to that. It's, um, the word maturity, the age is defined by maturity. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking by myself. I'm 42 now. Got nothing and to do with numbers, yeah. When I, age ain't nothing better than I've, I've been in the war with Yeshua or Jesus for many years. But when I truly walk with him, he change my truth and wisdom this yes, right. because you can be 40, 50, 60 mm. and be mature in age but what, what your actions and how you behave doesn't define that so right. the words are to seek is wisdom and understanding yeah. that's what we need to build on mm. now, maturity we're going to grow mature anyway yeah. we're going to grow you know we can't have that no but you know dynamically but, but wisdom understanding of scripture that's what grows us yeah. this mm. This, what I'm about to say, is for every young person in this room. This, what Junior just mentioned, is big. For Mika, Malik, Ashish, Ake, Aka, 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 Vishal, Akash, that's it, comes up right Destiny, ladies at the back, it's good to see you, by the way, long time no see. 
you need to hear this, young people, because the more you listen to the word, it will give you wisdom beyond your years. The word will mature you and give you understanding. I'm not talking about calculus and maths and algebra. I'm talking about life. The word will teach you how to do life. And in life, life is filled with people. And people will be the source of many issues in life, if not most issues. And through the word, you will gain wisdom as to how to handle people. You can never get away from people. Two things you can't get away from in this life, yourself and people. The word will teach you how to love yourself, how to discipline yourself. Then the word will also teach you how to love others and how to work with others. And here's the best bit. The word will teach you how to bring out the best in people and yourself. So the reason why it's important for all of you young people to be in here, whenever we meet together, you should be here. It's because here you will learn how to do life. School won't teach you that. By the by, yes, but not. School is not here to teach you how to do life. They'll teach you how to succeed according to a system. But right. Yahweh will teach you how to prosper and succeed, not only here, but in the kingdom. So it's important that you come, your ears are open, you have your Bible, and you follow the text, and you go home, and you do your reading. And Father, will ensure you will prosper to be whole some people in this world. Okay? Just have to get that in there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hear me and hear me well. And that's the last point. To succeed. We all want to succeed. In fact, what's the text say? How will a young man correct his ways? Is that one? Is it, it's, oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue. I know which one you're about. How will a young man prosper and succeed in the light of something that, that he basically will hear the word? I think he will hear the word. So this is just instruction. This is just righteous instruction applied. And if you follow these principles, you will succeed. You can't win everybody. You can't win with all people. But you can be a winner. You can be a winner. You can't always please everybody. Everybody will not always be your friend. But you can still be a winner. Because you follow Yahuwah's principles. And if Father likes you and approves of you, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. So, keeping in with this theme, there is something that is done in the whole Hebraic world, the Jewish world, called Tashli. And it's where they find a body of water. And it's a good thing to do with your spouse. It's a good thing as an, I love the Bible's filled with object lessons, not just the Bible, but Jewish culture is filled with object lessons. That at this time of the year, during these days of all, these 10 days before Yom Kippur, husbands and wives and uh, families will go to a body of water and they'll get a stone. And they'll literally think of that thing that's been holding us back. That issue that we had five years ago that you keep bringing up. We're going to take this thing and we're going to just... I thought you was going to say husbands and wives go to the river or something and just throw the other one in. <laughs> <laughs> it's done! It ain't coming back no more! <laughs> Thank you, Pastor G! I did it! No, I didn't say throw the, didn't say throw the husband in there. I didn't say throw the wife in there. Where the kids? Where the kids? <laughs> so we're casting away. And that's how we, and Father's trying to, and I know that this is not something the Jewish people just cooked up. This is coming straight from the Ruah. Father wants us, and he knows how we are, that until we have an object lesson where it becomes something tangible, something real, we won't connect the dots. So Father wants us to literally go to a body of water, Take that stone, that rock, that you found it on the floor, but really that rock's been in here. It just represents what's in your heart. We're getting the stones out of your stony heart. And we're taking it and we're throwing it into the sea and we're not going to be able to find it anymore. That's what Father says, I do with your sin. It's cast into the sea of forgetfulness. He remembers it, he recalls it no more. And that's how we should practice in being. 
And again, we are being the standard of love that others can learn and imitate. Kashli, so maybe during these days of awe, before the 10th, you might want to take your family to a lake, to a pond, to a river, and just starting with the children. Is there anybody that you want to, you think you should forgive? Is there anything that maybe, maybe I've offended you? Maybe I said something to you, and I'm your dad. And maybe I've hurt you, and I apologize. I love, I was with your family, I've been with your family a number of times on Shabbat. And I love every Friday night, your family bringing Shabbat. Before you break bread, you forgive each other mm. of anything done in that week. So they have like a Yom Kippur service every Friday night. You know, and this is good that they search out the family to see if there's any, is there aught, any stones in anybody's heart this week from something I've said to you. And Rohit starts and it goes round through the family. That's the high priest in action. Awesome. To error, to error is human, to forgive is divine. To error, to make mistakes, to mess up, that's human. But to have a heart that forgives and to live a forgiving life, that's divinity in you. Not that you are God, but Yahuwah is in you. And you let him live in you. That's love. That's love. Take a slap of that if you want to slip it. Remember that. We all mess up. We all drop the ball. But do we all rush in and heal with forgiveness? Do we forgive? That's divinity working through. Corinthians 13, we all know the chapter so well. What love is? Can, can I say? Yeah. Just in regards to, uh, again, uh, is there anybody hot? Is anybody cool? Are you all right? Good? Okay. Yeah, so obviously, it's, it's something that we become aware of, especially from the Father's scripture of Father Yeshua. But it's something that we have to practice and practice daily. Day day. Day. Yeah. We have to practice yeah. otherwise we won't have it. It, it just won't be there. You know, it won't be as strong as it's supposed to be. Because like, you know, at times you'll, you'll come across many different situations where you can think, yeah, I can forget, forget that. But then maybe that hard one where you're just like, well, I don't know. You know, and that's when that's the trying. That's, mm -hmm. that's the ones that what you said. That's, Following Yeshua is not easy. He never said it would be easy. And he never said that you'd be received and loved by everybody. You wouldn't be everybody's favorite. But he did say, if you follow me, you will be my personal child. You will be my favorite. You will be my talent. And the Father and I, I love this bit, I and my Father will come and dwell, sukkah, in you. I love that. Think of yourself. Here's me going on Zohar level today. Think of yourself, when we are like this, when we typify this, you become a garden of Eden that Father can walk in and enjoy walking with you in the cool of the day. He delights to be in you and around you. You attract his presence. That's what we're called to be, a sweet aroma that Father is drawn to. That's what he's asking for. Be like me so I can be in you. I, my Father, can dwell inside of you. But if you make yourself, instead of being a, a tube that's hollow that he can flow through, you block the tube, and Father can't freely move through you, then he just won't move through you. He'll move through somebody else that he can move through. Scripture says that darkness if you haven't read these books, mandatory reading. First John, second John, third John. Short books, but boy, them are big bullets. Mm -hmm. Them ones hurt because he just tells it like it is. And if we're not conforming to the image of Yeshua, then we are not in Yeshua, simple as. And he, he makes it very clear. So make those books your lunchtime. You can read it within one lunch break. First John, second John, third John. Very to the point. Okay, Bible's open. 
Hosea chapter 14, verses 2 through 10, please. Let's get some readers. No PowerPoint presentation, just everybody reading the scripture. The theme is returning to Yahuwah. What does that look like? Have it. You can start reading, please. Hosea chapter 14. In verse 2. Return, Yasharel, to Yahweh your Elohim, for your guilt has made you stumble. Mm -hmm. Take words with you and return to Yahweh. Say to him, Forgive all guilt and accept what is good. We will pay instead of fools the offering of our lips. Mm -hmm. Asher will not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will no longer call what we made with our hands our gods. For it is only in you that the fathers can find mercy. I will heal their disloyalty. I will love their freedom. For my anger has turned from me. I will be like a Jew to Yasharel. He will blossom like a lily and strike roots like the Lebanon. His branches will spread out. His beauty will be like an olive tree and his fragrance like the Lebanon. Again, they will live in his shade and raise grain. They will blossom like a vine and its aroma will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim will say, what have I to do anymore with idols? And I, I answer and affirm him. I am like a fresh green cypress tree, with fruitfulness, your fruitfulness comes from me. Let the wise understand these things and let the discerning know them. For the way of Yahuwah are straight and the righteous walk in them, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in them sinners stumble. Hallelujah. 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 So verse 2, take words with you and return to Yahuwah. What words? The word of Yah. The word of Yah will show you the way to return. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 27. Yet even now, says Yahuwah, turn to me with all your heart. Mm. With fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Tear your heart like your garments, and mm. turn to Yahweh your Elohim, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace, and willing to change his mind about disaster. Who knows? He may turn, he may turn change his mind, and leave a blessing behind him, in a full, grain offerings, and drink offerings. To present to Yahweh your Elohim. Blood the Shofar in Zion, proclaim a holy fast, full for a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the leader, gather the children, even infants sucking out the breast, let the bridegroom be his room, and the bride's the bridal chamber, let the covenant who serve Yahuwah stand weeping between the vestibule and the altar, let them say, spare your people Yahuwah, don't expose your heritage to mockery, or make them a Bible among the Goyim. Why should the people say, where is their Elohim? Then Yahuwah will become jealous for his land and have pity on his people. Here is how Yahuwah will answer his people. I will send you grain, wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you, and no longer will I make you a mockery among the Goyim. No, I will take the north of Northerner away, far away from you, and drive him to a land that is waste and barren, with his land guards toward the eastern sea, and his rear guards toward the western sea. His danger and continents will rise, because he has done great things. Don't fear, don't fear, O soil, be glad, rejoice, for Yahuwah has done great things. Don't be afraid, wild animals, for the desert pastures are green, the trees are putting out their fruits. The fig tree and vine, vine are giving full yields. 
Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in Yahweh your Elohim, for he has given you the right amount of rain in the fall. He makes the rain come down the you on the, the fall and the spring, spring rains. This is what he does first. Then the floors will be full of rain, and the vats of the flow of wine and olive oil. I will restore to you the, the years that the locusts ate, the grasshoppers, shearer worms, and cutter worms, my great army that I sent against you. You will eat until you are satisfied, and will praise the name of Yahweh your Elohim, who has done with you such wonders. Then my people will never again be shamed. You will know that I am with Israel, and that I am Yahweh your Elohim, and that there is no other. And my people will never again be shamed. Hallelujah. Lift up the shofar. <laughs> Turn to me, then I will cause your life to prosper. I will cause everything to open up for you when you return to me. So it sounds quite wordy, but when you study it, this is what Father's saying. In other words, this season of Yom Tua is an open window of blessing. This Shabbat Shuv, Father's saying, come back to the ancient pathways. If you've been slipping in your walk, if you've been kind of giving me 35%, now is the time to up the ante, come back to me with all your heart, return to me, and I'll return to you and ensure that your whole life just flourishes. If you've never known the right way, now's the time to jump in the lane because everything will get fast-tracked. This is the season. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. I love this one. Who has this? This is the book of Zechariah, chapter 1. It says, In the eighth month of the second year of Deri Wahiwish, the word of Yahuwah came to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Ido, the Nabi, saying, Yahuwah was very wrath with your fathers, and you shall say to them, Thus said Yahuwah of hosts, Turn back to me, declares Yahuwah of hosts. And I shall turn back to you, to you. declares Yahuwah of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, mm -hmm. to whom the former Nabi proclaimed, saying, Thus said Yahuwah of hosts, Turn back now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not obey or give heed to me, declares Yahuwah. Your fathers, where are they? And the Nebi'im, do they live forever? Last verse. But my words and my laws, which I command my servants, the Nebi'im, did they not overtake your fathers? Then they turned back and said, as Yahuwah of hosts planned, to do to us according to our ways and according to your deeds. So he has done with us. Praise the Most High. Hallelujah. Simply put, Father has said it. He will do what he has decreed. Right. His justice rules and reigns regardless of whether you, if you don't, if you listen, good. If you don't listen, he's going to do it. That's right. He's going to pour out judgment. But if you return to me, I'll return to you. So in other words, he's saying from the very beginning, I'm fair. Yeah. I'm not unjust. I'm not waiting to just beat you, beat you, and condemn you. Father's wanting to baruch you, to bless you. All you have to do is just fly right. Just, just walk right. And you'll be blessed. Malachi 3, verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> Malachi 3, verses 7 through 12. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my laws mm -hmm. and did not guard them. Turn back to me, and I shall turn back to you. Mm -hmm. Said Yahweh of hosts. Mm -hmm. But you said, In what shall we turn back? Pay attention. Would a man run away? Mm -hmm. okay. Yet you are robbing me. But you said, In what can we rob you? In the tithe and the offering. 
you have cursed me with a curse, or you are robbing me, this nation all of it. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, and let there be food in my house. And please prove me in this, said Yahweh of hosts, whether I do not open for you the windows of the Shemayim, and shall you pour out for you boundless Beraka. And I shall build the devourer for you, so that it does not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor does the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, said Yahweh of hosts. And all nations shall call you barren, for you shall be a land of delight, said Yahweh of hosts. So, just to be clear, I'm not standing here saying to you, if you sow a thousand pounds, Father's going to return to you uh, the mortgage paid. I'm not, there's nothing of that in Scripture. But what Father was saying is, whatsoever is your income, whatsoever you reap, you are to return a tenth of that. So if your income comes into you, then you are to return a tenth of whatever that income is. So if you're a farmer and all you do is just dealing in agriculture and that is your income, you don't actually handle money and that's 10% of that. But if you have a salary that comes in as a reward for what you do, 10% of that belongs to fathers. And that's for the provision of all things to do with his vision that he's given to the man of Yah or the temple at that time. So we are not to rob Yahweh by withholding the time. I didn't say give 100,000 or give 1,000 or give 500 and Father will bless you in proportion to how much you give. I'm not, that's nonsense. The scripture says tenth. Just a tenth. Father's not asking. He could ask for 90 if he wanted to. He could because everything is his anyway. He only asked for 10 to return that. Anyway, let's move on. But we have to, it's interesting that Father brings that up as part of returning to him. It's connected. You can't attend to Father, forgive me of all my sin, and neglect to return the time. That's all part of it, because the kingdom is maintained by the members of the kingdom returning their time. The way I see it is that if you're, if you're receiving edification from a ministry, um, then you should be rightfully supporting that ministry. If it's helping you to grow spiritually and helping you to deliver the words to others to bring them in and receive the, the barata that you're receiving as well, then you should be rightfully supporting right those so. ministries. It's Thank just, you, just like that. That's Thank you. Thing. And it says, furthermore, Shaul confirms that the ox, you cannot deny the ox from eating the corn that it treads. So the minister who's living is nothing. He has no other job but this. He has every right to take of that. That's how he's kept. The priesthood was kept by the time. But we're going back to the primary purpose here, that if you are drinking from this well, your, your responsibility is to maintain the well. You've got to maintain the well. Because that's where everybody's drinking from. When the well dry up, what are you going to drink? What are you going to drink? Thank you, Dwayne. Right, Jeremiah 4, verses 1 through 10. In fact, for time's sake, I'm going to skip that and get to the Big Daddy one. I love this one. Second Chronicles 7, we all should know this. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. We'll read this, and then we're going to close up down here and head upstairs. <laughs> everybody should, everybody, every child in this room should know these verses. You should, know, you should at least know where in your Bible to find this. The great prayer of Shlom, uh, Shlomo, Solomon. Mm -hmm. And this is a response to his prayer from Yahuwah. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. Do we have a reading, please? If I shut up the sky so that there is no rain, mm -hmm. or if I order logs to be cut down so that there is no rain, or if I send an epidemic of sickness among my people, then if my people bear my name and humble themselves, Pray, seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will have I gone too far? Keep going to far. Now, now my eyes will be open, and my ears will pay attention to the prayer made in this place. Now I have chosen and consecrated this house, so that my name can be there forever. My eyes and heart will always be there. 
As for you, if you will live in my presence, as did David your father, doing everything I have ordered you to do, and keeping my laws and rulings, then I will establish the throne of your rulership. As I covenant, covenanted, covenanted with David your father, when I said, you will never lack a man to be ruler in Israel, but if you turn away and abandon my regulations and mitzvah, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods, worshiping them, then I will put I will pull them up by the roots out of the land I have given them. This house which I consecrate for my name. I will reject from my sight, and I will make it an example to avoid and an object of scorn among all peoples. Well, there was a word in there that made everything conditional. What's that word? Yeah. Thank you. I said at the very beginning, everything requires and hinges on an action on your part. That's how a relationship works. It's not all incumbent upon me to do everything. It requires two to tango. We've heard that before. So Father says, if you do all these things, I will do my part. All you have to do is just do 50% and Father do the other 50. It's a relationship. We are not uh, independent. We are all interdependent. I rely on you, you rely on me. Together, we can make this happen. So this is what Father is saying. As long as Israel do their part, he will ensure you will have prosperity and shalom and blessing. If we don't, then he tells you what he will do. Any thoughts on that before we move on? Okay, I'm coming to Alana and Ariana at the back. Can you read Leviticus 23, verses 27 through 28? As we prepare now, we're coming up to Yom Kippur. So I know you got your Bible in your hand or on your phone. Could you read Leviticus 23 for us, please? Verse 27 through 28 and then jump to chapter 25, verse 9. Can you see it? <laughs> okay, 23, verse 27 to 28, and then 25, verse 9. Be careful to celebrate the day of the atonement, on the 10th day of the same month, nine days, after the festival of truth. You must observe it as an official day for holy assembly, a day to deny yourself and present special gifts to your Yehuah. Do not, do not work that entire day because it is the day of the moment. When offerings of purification are made for you, making you right with Yehuah for Elohim. Was that 25 miles as well? Yeah? One verse, yeah? Just the one verse. Is that finished? Okay. So, on this day, we have a fast prior to that. In the book of Acts, you'll recall when Shaul was on the prison ship heading toward the island of Malta, there was, he, he actually denotes in the book of Acts that they kept the day of the fast and Yom Kippur, so I think it's chapter 26, 27, 28, somewhere around there that Yom Kippur was occurring during the time of them being uh, carried on board the prison ship. And then the ship was um, caught up in the storm in the King James Rockledon, and it, the ship broke up. It was during the winter, and it was during the fast of Yom Kippur. So even in the book of Acts, it mentions that their observance was there of the feast. So in this time, we will be fasting, as I've said before, and is a day to be observed. It is a Shabbat as well as we've just read. So that day we take off. And I want everyone's mindful 
on, as Brother Raduki said earlier on, do we all realize what Yeshua has done? So on this time or during this time, everybody take account of your life and recall what Yeshua has forgiven you of. And this is why we give him thanks. Again, the Torah portion that is read is Natsavim, which means standing, Deuteronomy 29, verses 9 through chapter 31, verses 30. Again, that's to be read in your own time. Notice as well, um, I'll talk about Yom Kippur and the actual service, the priestly service that's done at Yom Kippur on the night of Yom Kippur. But notice how so much focus is on the blood. It mirrors Pesach, where the focus is also on the blood. Okay, so we'll see how certain things will mirror up. Yom Kippur is all about the judgment. And this is something what we have to be mindful of. The judgment is coming. The judgment is real. The righteous will be judged and the wicked will be judged. So this is what Yom Kippur is all about. The judgment. Pesach was about the judgment. Ten plagues were judging Egypt. And the final plague, that last plague, was the liberation of Israel. So the two mirror each other. This is probably why the rabbis over time have seen parallels but confused and called this Yom Teruah as Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, when in scripture he clearly says, Pesach will be the head of the year. Because there are parallels between the two. And it's easy to see how the two are similar and yet they separate the two. But in all of this, it's about the tribulation period, and we can talk about another time, where we look at the 10 plagues and how the 10 plagues of Exodus mirror up to the plagues in Revelations, looking at the tribulation period. But that's something for another class. What we'll be doing on the night of Yom Kippur will be a prophetic worship. It is a time of prophetic utterance and declaration and proclamation, prophetic prayer, blowing of the shofar, as we said before, the shofar represents the voice of Yeshua, the voice of the archangel. It's also symbolizing, uh, it, it means a call to the nations to come, but also it's a war cry against our enemies as well. So we're prophetically releasing this voice into the heavens, we're making war in the heavenlies against spiritual forces. And then we also break our fast as well. We feast together. So that is what we'll be doing. Uh, next week. I hope to see all of you and hopefully we'll have some returning visitors as well. Matt, I hope you've enjoyed your time with us today. I know you've had your hands full with the boys, but it's been good to have you.